divisions that exist so deeply within our country and remove, remove the stain of bloodshed. In the summer of 1968, social unrest could be seen and felt across the United States. The shock of the Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy assassinations was still fresh. If you do not leave, you will be subject to arrest. And there was a growing fear for loved ones fighting a war the majority of Americans were now against. In the midst of it all, thousands of service members, including many graduates of Marine Corps Basic School Class 568, prepared to go join the fight. On my way to Vietnam, I was in the San Francisco airport, and because I had gold bars on, there was a group approaching me that had protest signs, and they surrounded me. And there were quite a few people, and there were chants, and there were some taunts. But as I stood there and acknowledged the people who were doing what they are doing, in my heart, I knew that their right to do that was because there were people like me willing to stand in harm's way. Second Lieutenant Lar Litzter arrived in Vietnam in July and soon found himself in command of an infantry platoon. Doing you know, search and destroy missions on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, if they weren't wearing Marine Corps green or they weren't mountain yards, our objective was to kill them. That was our job. The enemy forces had the same objective. There's a very distinctive sound that goes with mortars that echoes through the valleys the canyons and up across the hills. Thoop, 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 thoop. And you knew that soon there would be explosions. When only two months into his tour, an enemy mortar found its mark. I was in a bomb crater with my platoon and the enemy landed the mortar round underneath me. As I came back to consciousness, the first question, of course, I cried out was to my men, was anyone else hit? And I remember one of the corporals said, sir, we've all been killed. And Lar vividly recalls another corporal's actions that he says really speaks to who Marines are. For several times, this one corporal, whose name was Newbold, Corporal Newbold, kept coming to my side. And I would try to get up, especially when we would get new incoming rounds of mortars. And I tried to get up, and Newbold put, pushed me down. And then he laid across my body, and I said to him, Newbold, go take cover. I could barely whisper. I remember Newbold saying to me, no, sir, I'm staying here. You can't take another hit. By the end of 1968, nearly 17,000 more Americans have died in Vietnam. Meanwhile, those carrying on the fight hear little news about the war's overall progress. They go about their missions focused on the job at hand. When we were there, see, you don't know the overall picture. You just know the ground in front of you. So what people reported and how they put it together didn't really see a whole lot. You know, we didn't have the type of outside world communications they have now. Most of what you heard was just what I'll call the everyday bitching and moaning, you know, uh, that we all do. For the most part, more concern about, you know, was there something decent to eat or was it possible to get clean or, you know, things of that type. At the same time, the American public doesn't always hear about the many good things happening in the midst of the war. The terrible things you hear about the war, they're the exception we were involved in building uh, schools and doing a lot of other things in, in uh, civic action in, in Vietnam that you hear so little about. And that second tour, all I did was work with civilians. And we built schools and dispensaries. Yeah, I helped uh, the Marines adopt orphans out of the three orphanages there. And, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a great experience. Do solemnly swear. January 1969. Richard Nixon takes office as the new president of the United States. Regarding Vietnam, 
He aims to negotiate a settlement that will allow the half million U.S. troops in Vietnam to be withdrawn, while still allowing South Vietnam to survive. I pledge to you, we shall have an honorable end to the war in Vietnam. Soon after, all hear the sobering news that U.S. combat deaths in Vietnam have exceeded the 33,629 men killed in the Korean War, a toll that now includes eight of the 241 graduates of Marine Basic School Class 568, Quint Wortham's classmates. When I heard that Ron Davidson had been killed, that Bill Jones had been killed, and John Abbott had been killed, it was a wake-up call for me because I knew that if they could kill those guys, they could kill me too. At the time, Lieutenant Worthams was serving in Vietnam as a communications officer in a command position unusual in those times of continued racial strife. In my case, I know there was no place else in the continental United States or perhaps even in the world where a black man could have 65 people reporting to him at 22 years old. And was it an issue being a black officer in command of a white platoon? No, I didn't allow it to become one. November 1969, the American public is shocked and appalled by reports of a massacre at My Lai. Photos show the bodies of hundreds of Vietnamese civilians, men, women, and children brutally murdered. And the reports say American soldiers are to blame. Soon, there are greater demands to get out of Vietnam. A new year begins. While the battle to end U.S. involvement in Vietnam goes on at home, on a hilltop in Vietnam, Lieutenant Ed Flanagan is serving as a forward air controller. And a lot of Purple Hearts are your own fault. And in this case, it was because we were in a safe bunker. And I thought if during the motor tech, if I could look outside and see where that muzzle flash was, I could run an airstrike on it and a mortar round came. And it was a head injury, but with a head injury, you bleed a lot, even though it isn't that serious, but I was really convinced that, that I was going to be dead soon. Spent the night in the bunker and in the morning called in my own medevac. That was in October and I was due to rotate in November and I thought, well, I'm good now. I, I can just take it easy and left the hospital and uh, wound up back on the same hill. And I really didn't want to be there anymore. I just wanted to go home. Two weeks later, Ed got his wish. And over the next year, the majority of the U.S. combat troops in Vietnam follow. By January 1972, only 133,000 remain. In December, peace talks between the U.S. and North Vietnam break down. President Nixon orders the most intense bombing campaign of the war, targeting North Vietnamese factories and ports. Over 12 days, U.S. aircraft dropped more than 20,000 tons of bombs. One month later, peace talks resume, and soon after, President Nixon signs the ceasefire agreement, ending U.S. military involvement in Vietnam. And where do we go from here? On March 29, 1973, the last American combat soldiers leave. South Vietnam must now fend for itself. That caused an emotional turmoil in me like nothing I'd ever experienced in my life. And I knew many, many of us who, if they would have said, get your stuff and go back over there, we're not going to let this happen. I know we'd have gone in a minute. We embrace them and, and say, we'll work with you to achieve this result. And then uh, uh, when, when things become difficult, we say, eh, well, we're leaving. As a civil affairs officer, I had 53 Vietnamese employees working for me, too. So I was equally concerned about all of those people because I knew what would be done to those people that uh, had fought with us uh, for their freedom. 